Thank you so much. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Yeah? That, that sounded like you were obligated to say good, but OK. Hey, have you guys ever played this game? Yeah. Bop it. Hold on. OK, that's as loud as I can get it. OK, Jared, can you come up and help me with your microphone? This game is this game's called Bop It. Where's I don't even know where the speaker is on it. I'm going to sleep. Ha, <laughs> he's going to sleep because I didn't. Okay. Blast it. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna try it. Are you ready? My score fifty-seven. Fifty-seven. That's my score. Bop it. Bop it. Twist it. Twist it. Pull it. Pull it. Spin it. Spin it. Flick it. Flick it. Huh. Pull it. Twist it. I'm doing pretty good. I'm gonna do my whole talk this way. I didn't hear what he said that time. Keep trying, you'll get it. Score oh, he said, nine. keep trying, you'll get it. So, ah, uh, thank you. Um, keep trying, you'll get it. Thanks, machine. Um, what's interesting, <laughs> this thing gets real sarcastic sometimes too. If you get like three, it's like, quick as a cat, meow. I'm like, hey. I have children to say things like that to me. I don't need you. Um, OK, wait. Is there somebody who, like, they dominate at Bop It and you want to try it on stage? You don't want to try it on stage, though? OK, you got to be beat my high score later so I can tell my kids that I did it. But because we fight in our house to see who can get the highest. I just beat it by, like, three. And I texted my kids. They're like, no, you took Bop It with you? Um, <laughs> right. They don't give me any credit for beating them. Um, well, let's try this then. Let's try this. Let's play Simon Says. So go ahead and stand up. Everybody stand up. Yeah, Simon didn't say to stand up. You all, you lose. It's like, OK, sit down. We'll try again. We'll try again. Sit down. Wait, Simon didn't say to sit down. Oh, no. Everybody sitting down loses. Oh, it's terrible. Oh, it's the worst. OK. You know, sometimes we look at the Christian life and we think this is what it is. It's like a game of Bop It or Simon Says, except instead of Simon, it's the Bible or Jesus or your pastor or somebody. Uh, you know, maybe everyone. Like, you have a list of people who can say the thing. So all the time you're like, okay, uh, what should I do today? Bop it. Okay, right? Twist it. Flick it. And, and then you're like, man, I don't even want to pull it. Okay, fine. Uh, and, and, and this is the Christian life. And then sometimes we get instructions we don't want to do. Right, like, hey, don't bop it. And you're like, but I really want to bop it. You know what I mean? Uh, and, and we think this is what it is, that the Christian life is this thing where there's this series of directions and rules and ideas and laws, and that our job is to follow as many of them as we can, and eventually we screw up because we're who we are, and, and then God or church or our pastor or our loved ones say, Quick as a cat, meow, right? You messed up, start over. And maybe as you start, keep going, right? As you've been a Christian for a really long time, you know, the bop it machine keeps going faster and faster with more and more, and you can get up to 177, uh, but you never beat the game, right? You still, you still lose, and you still start over at the beginning, and you keep going. Because we think that the Christian life is about following the rules, uh, and I'm about to say something really upsetting to a lot of you. Um, and all I ask is that if you decide to stone me later, you give me like a five to 10 minute start, head start, because I'm a slow runner. <laughs> I'm wearing flip flops. It's dark. Like, you gotta, there's gotta be some sport in it, I'm saying. <laughs> um, so, so I wanna say this to you Jesus doesn't want you to follow the rules. I'll say it again for all the people who just woke up and said, what, huh? We brought a heretic? Uh, Jesus doesn't want you to follow the rules. He doesn't. He doesn't. He, he wants you to be transformed so that you don't need them. Uh, and that's something different and weirder and harder and better and more exciting. And it's, it's a completely different life. And that's what we're going to be talking about this weekend. How, not how to follow the rules. I don't care if you follow the rules. I honestly, literally do not care. 
uh, but rather how to be changed into the type of people who don't need any rules. Now, for some of you, that sounds really confusing and weird right now, and, and, and you're not going to hear anything else I say the rest of the night, and that's okay, because we're going to come back to this tomorrow morning. So if you're processing, don't get stressed out. It's fine. You're not getting left behind. Um, but let's do this. I, 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 want, I want to make sure you understand something about me, and that's that uh, in religious culture, in spiritual cultures, in, in churches and things like this retreat, sometimes we can come to a place where we enter in lying about ourselves and what we think and who we are and what we're in the middle of, and I don't have any time for that. I'm not going to lie to you about me and who I am and where I am and what I think. I'm not going to give you an answer because I think it's the right answer. I'm just going to be honest with you. And I think if you want to get the most out of this weekend, I'm going to ask you to be honest with me, with yourself, and with each other. So when someone comes up and says, hey, how's it going? And you're like, actually, uh, my hammock's really terrible, and I hate my entire family, and I'm glad to get away for two days. Uh, like, could we just say that? Is that OK? Like, I think so. I think that would be fine. And I'm not saying, like, let's be mean to each other. Um, let's just say, I would like to be mean to you. You know? <laughs> well, let's just be honest. We don't have to be mean. We can just say, I, I want to be mean, but I know that I shouldn't. Fair warning. <laughs> right? And I want to say this, too. I know in a crowd of this size and, and having lived in Christian culture most of my life that there are some men here who got tricked into coming. <laughs> and you're like, why is all the music talking about God? And why is there a sermon happening now? <laughs> what, how? I thought we were going to shoot guns and swim and eat steak. And where, how did this part come in? In fact, I was at a conference once. It was a, um, a Greek conference for college kids who are in uh, fraternities, right? And we were there, and this kid comes up to me. His name was Charlie. And he goes, dude, I do not know how I got here. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, I mean, I woke up this morning. I literally was like, where am I? And I was like, what? So I called some of his brothers over, and I said, what's up with Charlie? They're like, he was super drunk last night when we left, and we were like, Charlie, do you want to go to this Christian thing? He's like, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, OK. And I said, Charlie, I think you're here for a reason. And then he prayed to receive Christ. And then he was happy he came. You know, it's good and everything. But it could be that you're here right now and you're like, man, my friend lied to me. <laughs> like, one, you should probably have words about that. Um, and two, I just want to say we're glad you're here. Amen. And don't feel any pressure. Don't feel any pressure to pretend like you're all in on this stuff that other people are all in on. It's cool. Again, be honest. Just be like, yeah, I'm not a Christian. I came because I really, really love steak. And I heard that I would like to see a lot of men try to eat two pounds of steak. It's just <laughs> one of my hobbies, right? That's fine. So let's just be upfront. And the second thing is, I know that there are probably some people in this room who've been pretending that you're followers of Jesus for a long time because there's some social benefit to it, like uh, it makes your wife happy uh, or or, you know, something with your job, or there's some cultural thing. And I just want to say, hey, you're welcome here too, and we don't, need to, we don't need to play pretend here. It's okay to be upfront about that. And there's some people here who are probably confused, like not sure where they are on things, and that's great, and you're welcome here. And there's some people who are followers of Jesus who haven't been following for a long time, and you thought, well, let's just give it a shot because worst case scenario, I get half a chicken for dinner. Right? It's fine. I'm glad you're here. And there's some of you here who are so passionate about Jesus that it's almost inconceivable to you that people would be in these other categories. And that's great, too. Like, pray for the rest of us. We're glad you're here, too. Um, so, so let's start with this. The Bible's weird. There is so much weird stuff in the Bible. 
Uh, there are so many stories that only make sense if you've been listening to them since you were a child and someone acted like it was normal. <laughs> you know how kids just don't know that it's weird, the stuff that they believe, because it's just, you told them it. My nine-year-old just was watching Jurassic Park and just found out it wasn't actual dinosaurs. She was like, those aren't real? I said, no, those are like, com those are like robots. And she's like, does it hurt the people when the robots bite them? And I was like, kid, whoa, your world's about to change. And I started explaining it to her. She's like, this is fake? So mad, right? And I was like, I went, I went to bed that night. I asked my wife, I was like, she's nine. Like, how have we failed as parents? And I'm really worried about how much she loves Harry Potter and when are we gonna break it to her? Like, she just doesn't know. But there are these things in the Bible that the stories are weird, right? Like um, Jesus walks up to people in the middle of their lives and he says, hey, follow me. Leave everything and follow me. And they're like, yeah. And they walk out the door. <laughs> right? Like imagine that today. You're going into Burgerville or something, right? And you're standing in line at Burgerville. Some dude walks in off the street. He looks back over the counter. He says, hey, everybody who works here, hey. Follow me. And they're all like, yeah. <laughs> and they walk out, and you're like, I don't know how to make burgers. My wife's on vacation, and I just, my mom's gone this week, and my fries are burning. Right? Super weird. Or imagine you come into Portland, you're walking down the street, you come by this alley, and some guy's like, Hey, hey. Yeah, what? Follow me. <laughs> no. No. No, no, no. No, I'll follow me. I'll teach you how to catch men. No. <laughs> no, you're creepy. I'm not coming with you. Right, so what is it? What it? So if we look at these stories, we gotta understand what is it that makes this story actually make sense? Because the people in Jesus' time were normal human beings. They weren't gonna ditch their Burgerville, Burgerville meal to just walk off with a stranger. Something else is happening, right? And part of it is that the word we use, disciple, means something different than we typically think of it. It means like learner, right? It means student. And when we think of students, so if you think back to, uh, or forward for some of us, if you think to a math teacher you've had, uh, say in high school, high school math teacher, what, the, you go to class with the intent of learning what they know, right? There's an impartation of knowledge. You want to know the quadratic formula because it's going to come in super helpful in the future. <laughs> For, for many of us. And I know it. I'm not saying I don't know it. I'm just saying you should know it. So you need the quadratic formula, so you go to math class. And it, that's what we think of when we think of a student. I go, I find someone who knows things I don't, and they tell me those things. And then I know them. And then maybe I get some benefit from passing a test or getting a grade or a degree or whatever, right? Then I get a job and et cetera. Uh, but, but in the first century in Israel, for, for people, when they heard about rabbis and disciples, that's not how they thought. What, what they thought was, uh, you go to a teacher, a rabbi, in order to become like them. Not just to learn what they know, that's part of it, but also to become like them. So now think about your math teacher again. And you would go to the math class because you want to learn how to dress the way they dress and, and how, to, how to do math the way they do for sure, but how to be a teacher, how to live their lifestyle. And it might change who you choose to be your teacher, right? It might alter it a little bit. And that's, that's what in the first century they understood. If you said disciple, they said, okay, I'm going to be a disciple of someone that I want a life like their life. So what did uh, someone like 
Simon, from Simon Says, uh, what did Simon Peter know about Jesus? Well, we know a few things, right? We know that one day that Jesus came into uh, their religious gathering and he was handed the scriptures and he read in there uh, sort of a little speech in the Bible about uh, how the Holy Spirit was on him and had anointed him to teach good news to the poor and recovery of sight for the blind and freedom for the captives, and to say, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Right? So he had this mission, good news for the poor, and, and freedom for those who are captive. There's something compelling about that. That's something that I look at and I go, okay, you have my attention. Right? And then Peter says, uh, Jesus, come, come to my house for a meal. He's interested. He wants to get to know him better. So Jesus comes to his house for a meal. But, but Peter's mother-in-law is sick. She has a fever. And this is uh, actually in the book of Luke that we hear this story. And Luke was actually, the, the writer of this story, was a doctor. So he uses these really technical um, medical terms. So there are different terms in Greek for a fever. So there's mikrolos, which means a small uh, fever. There's megalos, which means a high or a, a, a bad fever. And then there's mikolatos, which means dance fever. And it was <laughs> one of the most dreaded fevers of the first century. But what it says in scripture is that uh, Peter's mother-in-law had a high fever, a, a megalos, a high fever. And uh, now imagine, you got to imagine in the first century, what do you do if someone in your family or yourself, you have a high fever, what do you do? You, you die. Did someone say you die? Okay. Rough family life. Gosh. Remind me. What, 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 what do you do typically if you have a high fever? Okay, I, I did hear someone say drugs. Uh, how many people do some sort of medication. So, uh, a bunch of people are like, I know Matt said to be honest, but I'm tough. <laughs> I just barf my guts out in my bed and just <laughs> wait for it to pass. I understand. That's fine. I mean, I take drugs. Uh, but you can't, you, uh, uh, when I have a fever only. <laughs> Never other times. Uh, Advil, right? It, it wasn't like, hey, Peter, go get some Advil, mom's sick. No, what, they, it wasn't invented yet, right? Oh, hey, go get some ice. Hey, it's the first century and we live in a desert. <laughs> so this was actually really dangerous. There, people would get brain damage. People would, would die like this one gentleman's family uh, <laughs> from high fevers. It was common. So this wasn't like a small deal. And so Peter asks Jesus if he would come and just look at his mother-in-law. And, and Jesus does. It says he came in and he saw that she was sick and he rebuked the fever, which I don't know. That sounds crazy to me. That's another crazy thing from the Bible. Hey, you fever, knock it off. And it's like, <laughs> pop it. It goes, right? It's like it just does what it's told. And, and then Peter, everyone's amazed. In fact, the mother-in-law feels so good, she jumps up and is like, hey, let me make dinner. And everyone's like, yeah, great. So she makes dinner. And then everyone in the neighborhood starts hearing, hey, she had a high fever, and Jesus told it to knock it off, and she was fine. And everyone's like, uh, my leg's broken. And they all start coming over. And Jesus, it says, he taught, and he healed people, and he cast out demons all night long in Peter's living room. And the whole neighborhood is crowding in there. So, so Peter knew that Jesus was someone with a compelling mission, and he knew that he was a person of power, that he could do these things, these amazing things, the unexpected things. And then, of course, they're looking for Jesus later, and he's sl slipped away. Um, and then another day, Peter's out fishing with his, with his brother and others that he works with, and Jesus uh, comes along in his teaching, and people are crowding in so close that, it, that he can barely speak. And so he turns to Peter and asks if he can sit in the boat. 
And, and he says, put it out a little bit into the water. And, and then he does. And they've already been fishing all night. And Jesus says to him, we don't know exactly what he was teaching. It could have been any number of things, but I wonder if it could have been a parable, like there's a parable about fishing, you know, that in the, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that's lowered in and they bring in the fish and they throw out the bad and, and burn them in garbage and they keep the good, right? It might have been something like that. Who knows? But for whatever reason, he turns to Peter and he says, Peter, let, in, let out the nets for a catch, and Peter says, look, I owe you for the whole mother-in-law thing. <laughs> I do. But we've been fishing all night, us, the professional commercial fishermen, <laughs> and, and we haven't caught anything. And do you know why we fish at night? Because we catch more fish. And now it's daytime, and we've just cleaned our nets. So we're not going to catch anything? But because you said so, you know, and I owe you, We'll let in the nets and just see what doesn't happen. <laughs> so he throws in the nets, and it's like every fish within a two-mile radius was like, bop it. <laughs> and they all <laughs> came into the nets. In fact, the nets were so full that the, the, that the boat started to sink. And, and, and so Peter says, Hey, guys, with the other boat, come help us. We're sinking. We have too many fish. And they come over, yeah. And then their boat starts to sink. And, and Peter is so overwhelmed that he falls on his knees in the boat, which, remember, is full of water and likely fish. <laughs> and he says, go away from me, Lord, because I am a sinful man. And then Jesus says, don't be afraid, which is what he always says before he says something terrifying. <laughs> Don't be afraid. From now on, what you just did here with the fish, I'm going to teach you how to do that with human beings. And it says that they pulled up on the shore, and they left everything, and they followed him. They became became his disciples, his students, because, because they knew that he had a compelling mission. They knew that he had power to do things they had never seen before. And he was a better fisherman than them, <laughs> by far. So, so when they said, what kind of life do I want? Do I want the life that I have? Or do I want a life like his? It was kind of a no-brainer. And they were willing to do whatever it took to become like him. And I think what happens for a lot of us is we get all turned around and, and confused on this topic, actually. So, so I'll give you an example. I bet for some of us, we read the Bible verse, this is the theme verse on here. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure, Philippians 2, 12 uh, through 13. And we immediately went to this bop it construction of Christianity. Like what you're telling me is this weekend, you're going to tell me all the things I'm doing wrong, all the things I need to change in my life, and you're going to tell me, here's, stop being stupid and do it the right way, <laughs> right? Because that is the message we hear sometimes. And I don't know about you, I don't particularly like that message. And, and some of us probably looked at this verse and said, oh, great, that again. Like, I'm just going to feel bad about not being perfect. Um, but, you know, it's Luke 640, Luke 640, where Jesus says, a student is not above the teacher. But when a student is fully trained, he becomes like the teacher, like the teacher. So, so I think this is, this is part of what's happening, right? But what happens is we start to look at our lives and we say, okay, if I'm really going to be the Christian, the person who's following Jesus, here's this long list of things that I like that I would like to be like Jesus except for. 
I want to keep these things for myself. And I don't know what they are. You know. Right now, probably some of you are like, oh, yeah, those things. Yes, I do like those. Um, or sometimes there are things you don't like but can't figure out how to jettison, right? Like, why do I still have this? I've been following Jesus all this time, and I can't seem to get rid of this one thing in my life that's corrupting and destroying things. And either way, I think what happens is we get caught up in this idea of the cost of following Jesus. And there is a cost, and Jesus talks about that. He says, you, you know, you don't start building a house without knowing if you have the money and materials to do it, because otherwise you're going to get it halfway done, and all the neighbors are going to walk by and go, ha ha, right? And, and, and you don't set out to do a treaty with someone you're at war with unless you know that you're able to pay the cost of ending the war. So Jesus does talk about the cost of following Jesus, but sometimes we don't think about the cost of not following Jesus. And so often, the way that Jesus talks about this is not in the sense of, hey, here's what you need to do, here's what you need to give up. Instead, he says, here's what you're going to get. I'll tell you a story. My friend Roland uh, makes his living by going to um, flea markets. Have you guys been to flea markets before? It's like everyone brings all their garbage and sets it out. And then you walk around and see if you want to buy it. Now, some people get more, you know, some people do other things or they have really nice stuff or whatever. But what Roland does is he looks around for things that nobody recognizes their value. Sometimes, so he knows all sorts of weird stuff, man. Like he's like, oh, I found an Alfred Shaheen Aloha shirt. And I'm like, what does that even mean? Well, he's like the guy who originally made Aloha shirts. They look like other, it just looks like an old shirt, but it's worth a bunch of money. I'm like, well, that's amazing. How often do you find those? He's like, oh, once, you know? Or, or he finds an old Beatles 45 or something, which is not a gun for the younger folks in the audience. <laughs> um, you know, he, he's just aware of what all these things are. And, and so one day, though, one day, he's, uh, he's flipping through some old posters. A bunch of them are facsimile posters, right? So like. It looks like an original Casablanca movie poster, but it's not. It's like a new one that's been... So he's like flipping through. And then he sees something really surprising. Uh, in fact, really weird. And he, he pulls it out, and it's, uh, he recognizes it almost immediately. It's comic book art, like original comic book art. And it's in really good shape. Uh, and as he starts to look at it more closely, he recognizes the comic it's from. It's from a comic called Action Comics Number 1, which is the first appearance of Superman. And if you could find just a copy of Action Comics Number 1 in, like, mint condition, you know, with white paper and straight edges on the corners and all this, you could basically name your price. Uh, but to find the original art, there's, like, eight pages in here. So he's like, there's no way the guy running this stall has any idea what this is worth. Because it's literally in here with like the Casablanca posters and things. So he's smart, right? He grabs a couple of posters and he slips the art in the middle. And he goes up to the guy and he goes, hey, how much for all this junk? Right? And the guy running the stand just looks at him like he's an idiot. And he goes, you think I don't know? <laughs> how much that comic art is worth, don't you? And he's like, oh, man, yeah, I did think that. Uh, and the guy says, uh, yeah, I'll sell it to you for half a million. <laughs> and Roland goes, oh, that's a terrible price. How about 450? He's like, no, half a million. Uh, but inside, he's going nuts because he knows a single page of that. He could probably sell for 20 million, yeah. like at auction. Who knows? how much it'll go for. So he says, hey, I'm going to need to move some stuff around. Will you hold this for me? Half a million, you got a deal. The guy says, yeah. So Roland goes home. He sells his house <laughs> and his car and his waffle iron <laughs> and like his golf clubs, his clothes, his dog. Like he sells everything, everything he has, and he scrapes together half a million dollars. And he literally, he goes back to the flea market 
wearing like his shower flip-flops and like workout shorts that he uses for painting and a t-shirt from the original men's roundup. <laughs> and he gets back there and he goes up to the guy and he gives him the half a million dollars and the guy hands him all of his, you know, art and he walks away and he feels cheated, depressed, unhappy, sad about the things he gave up. No, he's ecstatic. And when they eventually have an art show and he puts up all the art and all the people come in and they're like, oh, this is amazing, how did you find it? How much did these cost you? He says, only everything. And it was a bargain. Right, and this is the story, this is the way Jesus tells us about this. This is how Jesus talks about it. If you look in Matthew 13, um, he, he says this, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought the field. And then he says again, the kingdom of heaven is like a, a, a pearl salesman, a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had to get that pearl. This is the way Jesus tells the story. And, and what this tells us is this. If we, when we, look at the things that are required to follow Jesus and we say, I'm not sure I want to give this up, what that tells us is that we are not recognizing the treasure. We're not seeing it. We're, we're focusing on the cost of following and missing the cost of not following. Because if we understand the price and the treasure, if we really understand them, then we, like Roland, will be able to say, when someone says, what does it cost to follow Jesus, can say, with joy, only everything. Only everything. That's all. And a bargain at that price. So, where does that leave us? It leaves us right here. Jesus walked up to these men on the beach after they had seen all these fish come into their boat, and he said, follow me. And they knew what that meant. That meant, come with me, leave everything behind, and I will teach you how to have a life like my life. My mission, my power, my, my fishing abilities, my, uh, and I'm going to teach you how to help men come to know God. If that's what you want, follow me. If that's what you want, follow me. And they, they chose to do so. So what I'm here to tell you that is this. This weekend, Jesus is present here with us. And to every one of our hearts, whether you're someone who's been following Jesus your whole life, or someone who has never followed Jesus, Jesus is saying these same two words to us. Follow me. It's an invitation, not a command. He's inviting us. He's asking us, do you want a life like my life? If you do, leave all of that other stuff and come with me. Follow me. Tomorrow night, during this time, we're going to have a time with some people who are available to pray, uh, some counselors and others available. Between now and then, I want you to be thinking, some of you already know what it would mean giving up to follow. You're like, there's this thing I'm holding on to. There's this question I have. There's this thing I don't want to do that God wants me to do. Start thinking about that because Jesus has brought you here to offer you this deal. Become like him and leave that behind. And tomorrow night, you don't have to wait for tomorrow night. If you want to do it tonight, it's fine. Uh, but tomorrow night, we'll have some people available here. And it gives you some time to think about it, to pray about it, and to talk about it with your friends. Please, grab somebody. Uh, or if you want to talk with me or one of the other uh, staff here, come talk to us. We'd be glad to. There are so many pastors here. 
Find a pastor if you'd like, or missionary, uh, or, or any, anyone here would be thrilled to talk to you about those things. I, I feel certain. And remember, we're, we're going to commit to being honest with each other. So that's tomorrow night. And I want to say this too. Uh, for some of us, we think of the idea of following Jesus as something you make a decision once. And there are some things that that is true about in the spiritual life. There's another sense in which most of us are making a decision every day whether we're going to follow or not. Every, every hour sometimes. But there can be hardships that come, difficulties, stubbornness, whatever, that, that I may decide to follow today, but that's no guarantee about tomorrow. So it may be that this weekend that there are some of us who need to just say, hey, today is the day I'm going to follow again. I'm back in. It's been a little while, but here I am. Make me like you. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, you said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of human beings. You said that if we followed you, that uh, we could become like you, which is an astonishing, terrifying promise. I cannot imagine what that could completely be like, but I want it. Jesus, give us insight into our hearts. Give us eyes that we can see you, ears that we can hear you, and hearts that we can understand you. And I pray that this weekend, that in the lives of one another, in the words that are spoken in different places, in the music, in the places when we're hanging out, in the gift of the food you give us, that we would see you clearly. And that we would know for sure in this conversation the cost of following and the cost of not following. And you'd give us courage to be honest and to do the thing that we most deeply want to do. In your name, amen.